Games change a lot during development, and for the most part, you'd never know. However, busy developers often leave behind traces of mothball features and ideas, and all it takes is some enterprising use of mods or console commands to get a glimpse of what might have been. Come with us now, then, as we uncover five incredible secrets hidden inside your favourite PC games. Few games are more important to the history of first-person shooters than Half-Life. Valve's masterpiece used inventive scripting sequences, including its now legendary opening tram ride, to tell a sci-fi horror story with unusual style and fidelity. The game underwent several key changes during development, however, including engine and art improvements and a number of key redesigns. But several unused enemies are still present in Half-Life's game files, including this Aliens-inspired minigunner, a throwback to a time when the game's military foes had more attitude than the faceless G-men they'd subsequently become. The adorable Chum Toad was also originally planned for inclusion in Half-Life, but eventually found a home in the Opposing Force and Blue Shift expansions. The Spied Archer was an aquatic enemy that would shoot barbs at the players, while the Kingpin was a psychic foe that has echoes of the Combine advisors from Half-Life 2. And then there was the Panther, the unholy union of a hound eye and a vortigant, and I'm really sorry about that mental image, and the Floater, which is what would happen if bladders could fly. And finally, there's this fellow, Mr. Friendly, a haunted naked horse thing who would attempt to uh, cuddle you to death. Worst of all, even when the models are loaded into a custom map, Mr. Friendly rotates to face the player at all times. Please stop, Mr. Friendly, all right? No, just take your flesh hooves away from my zone of intimacy. Thank you. Hitman has come a long way in the 17 years since the first game, Hitman Codename 47. Even so, you'd be surprised by how much of IO Interactive's open-world assassination sim's identity was established early on. Agent 47's signature suit, his barcoded head, and the world of spies and criminals he inhabits are very much present and correct. Now, as we all know, 47 is played by David Bateson, the actor who would perform the role in every subsequent game in the series. His deadpan delivery establishes 47's personality, even when the script doesn't exactly give him that much to work with. Not really my scene. Oh, <laughs> calm down. Crikey. It might be a surprise to learn, therefore, that the first version of the game didn't have Bateson as Agent 47. The original actor, whose work is still evident in the demo, gives a far more upbeat performance, and clearly IO didn't feel that this was right for the game. Even so, the job of replacing 47's actor wasn't 100% complete by the time the game shipped. One line from the original actor survives. In Budapest, 47 can interact with the hotel staff to find clues to his target's location. In Bateson's voice, obviously. Mr. Tobias Reaper. But find a bellboy and steal his clothes, and 47 sounds rather different when he speaks to the hotel receptionist. Now seriously, imagine this guy in blood money. Why don't you sort some mail then, macho pig? Uh, what? No! And in case you're wondering if this is just a voice that 47 is putting on, it isn't. This is what the real Agent 47 sounds like when he's pretending to be a bellboy. Clean towels for Mr. Wolf. And that's better. Jedi Academy lets you step into the breezy robes of Star Wars' lightsaber-wielding warrior monks like never before. Its melee combat system, open-ended structure, and extensive customization options made this a toolbox for role players, modders, and anyone else who's ever bashed two Star Wars action figures together. As Jedi in training Jaden Core, you travel the galaxy doing everything from racing suit bikes to taking a lightsaber to a whole bunch of Tusken Raiders. Developers Raven Software had loads more ideas for the game than made it into the final version, however particularly when it comes to vehicles. Jedi Knight is already a great lightsaber sim, but it was almost a starfighter sim too. Using console commands, it's possible to see some of these for yourself, although the confines of the game's existing single-player maps aren't exactly conducive to dogfighting. There's a barely controllable X-Wing, including working S-foils, and even a Z-95 Headhunter, the precursor to the Rebellion's legendary starfighter. As you can see, it's a little bit harder to fly. You can pilot Imperial ships too, and even crash them repeatedly into the ground like a true TIE pilot. The devs also experimented with mounts, and while the final game does let you ride a town town, cut content includes this player-controlled rancor and this noble attempt to figure out how one might go for a ride on a Wampa. It's somewhere between jockeying a big dog and a hairy uncle. Deus Ex is still regarded as one of the most important immersive sims ever made. As Cyborg Special Agent JC Denton, you have the freedom to approach each mission in your own way, even though most of the time that means screwing up your stealth approach and resorting to beating anonymous guards to death with a baton. The game tells a story of world-spanning intrigue that begins at the base of the Statue of Liberty. This wasn't the only American monument to feature in the original plan for Deus Ex, though. During the game's development, Ironstorm planned a story-heavy mission set in the White House. 
Although the mission itself was never created, many of the props and characters that it would have used exist in Deus Ex's files. Using console commands, it's possible to see a few of these in the game today. From the Oval Office's desk and chair, to cabinets, benches and a piano that you can even use to play a few notes of the Deus Ex theme. President Philip Mead and First Lady Rachel Mead are present in the game's files too, and appear very briefly during the opening cutscene. But despite being fully animated, nobody seems to mind if you attack the President of the United States with a stun baton. <laughs> Probably best just to leave that one there. Everybody remembers Mass Effect 2 for its companions. Shepard's death and subsequent resurrection during the game's opening wiped the slate clean, giving us a new Normandy and a new boss in the elusive man who directed us to head out into the galaxy in search of the best, the baddest and the most backstory-laden people in the Milky Way. But you can't recruit everybody straight away. Broadly speaking, the game is divided into sections with a different group of companions available in each. These sections are separated from one another by mandatory missions given to you by the elusive man himself. As soon as you're getting used to exploring the galaxy at your own pace, the boss and the game sticks you on the rails. Mass Effect 2 wasn't always structured this way. In fact, dividing the game up was a decision that was made rather late in development. Originally, Shepard was supposed to be able to recruit any of the game's companions in any order. The scripts were written with this in mind, meaning that characters like Tally and Legion, who can't be recruited until the second half of the game, have unique lines of dialogue much earlier, like during Garrus' recruitment mission. And you can see some of these interactions yourself by using a save editor to hack in these late game companions into an early game save. If only there was a hack for making Samara love Shepard as much as she loves justice. Find peace in the embrace of the goddess. And there you have it, five secrets and features that you never knew existed until now, lurking right there in your favourite PC games. Thanks for watching.